My next question really is about mistakes and I'm sure you know you've seen many in your experience. Tell us some of the common mistakes that you've seen founders, entrepreneurs of course on a no-name basis making and what's your advice on how to handle some of the situations? Uh, I recently I read Malcolm Gladwell's Outlier. It talks about success, what does one need? IQ, EQ, intellect, hard work and humility. So actually if you draw this analogy to fintechs, Tech is your intellect, right? Your fin is the risk because tech is the reach. The yeah. shop front from Cochin to my pocket. You don't need to have a the shop front. The shop front is Google app, Google yeah. Play Store. Uh, your risk, which is the fin part of it, the underwriting risk. And the humility part one believes is the customer. You know, whenever one of these don't work and fintechs are very good at the tech part, which is yeah. the IQ part. Uh, the ones who are good at the fin part, which is understanding risk. And, you know, risk is not something you are taught in a physics class. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, it takes generations to understand cycles. Uh, so to link this to the question, what, what mistakes one has seen? You know, either, okay, first is somebody, if somebody is too aggressive, you know, very often if somebody comes to us and says, I am dispersing 300% month on month. That is, even if you are, don't tell anyone because regulators don't like that kind of a growth because that means it's like, you know, a seven-year-old becoming 17 in two years. You really haven't seen that journey to build the bone structure, the muscle structure, i.e. the people and the systems required for that growth. Second, uh, risk. Now, risk is judgment. Too, too conservative and you, nobody will know you, right? Which is why I feel former bankers actually have been the best founders at least in my experience, because what they bring is, you know, uh, restraint. Uh, too much of a finding a crevice or a crack in the guidelines, as Prajit mentioned, and playing in that, and then one circular comes in, your whole model is finished, and then you sit and blame, why me? Uh, I think the third area where I've seen actually fortunes, I mean, look at Pine Labs, for example. You look at the top five or ten best new age companies, it's the quality of talent they've hired. Whether it's a rubber stamp or it's somebody, be it a legal head or a CC, we only talk about the operations chief of staff, founder, CFO. Nobody talks about, you know, below that. Yeah. Your HR, surprisingly, I realize your HR head, the quality of that person is very important. Your risk head, your policy head, you know, policy head, if too aggressive, will give you a bit of a salesy. Uh, and it's happened with a few large global American corporations that the public policy head have, you know, been in the news for the wrong reasons. Your general counsel, how empowered that person is. So ultimately, and you look, it's not easy to find talent in early stage, right? There's a cost to it. Uh, but to get your people, right, who are as close to a bank's way of thinking without being limited by, by banks. So I'll give you an example. You know, there have been cases where... Uh, you know, funding is coming. Now, funding is stuck because you wanted to do an insurance entity which is sitting under the platform entity, but you didn't get the license, but the main object still say insurance. And the AD bank saying, where is your FDI cap? And you thought it was 100%. Yeah. Right. Also, um, conscious that there is no one company. Any, every fintech is a web. You will find at least 8 to 10 companies sitting in any fintech, especially the new age bank door fintechs. FDI caps, sectoral regulations, uh, that, that's first mistake I've seen. Second mistake I've seen is living on hope. It's a subjective mistake. But you know, when you fee believe that you know, you're, you can bend reality, the whole Steve Jobs, he, there's a saying that he used to live in alternate reality. He, very Elon Musk kind of, I'll, you know, I'll change the world. You know, you can't, banking is the only sector where an IIT graduate cannot, cannot disrupt it. I personally feel, again, like maybe I'm a skeptic. Uh, I don't know what is, if you look at Medici's, the word bank comes from the bench, yeah. Italian Florence. It's a simple business. It's an arbitrage business. It's now because the large becomes slow, so the new want to distribute faster through the tech interface. But there's nothing that the banks can't do. 
No, I agree. And I was just, while you were talking and you gave all these wonderful examples, one thing that comes to my mind is, we've always been fighting for that level playing field and we've been asking it for digital. It never happened. And, and yeah. I'll tell you, uh, Danya, it should not even be given. Yeah. Because it's quite like seeing a teenage son saying, I will run the house. You know, it's not, that's not how the world works. So it takes decades and years to expect level playing field. By the way, the level playing field is the day you get a banking license. I was just a coming universal, to that. universal, yes. not a differentiated yes. payments or SFB. That's or even if field. it's a digital banking license, you cannot forego the responsibilities that come with it. And as you rightfully said, I think one of the things that I have also seen in my experience is that the org structure is seldom taken care of in the first few years. It's always growth and it's always growth maybe in the past at any cost. If I were to ask you in the last 10 years, yeah. which new name has come in the BFSI space, FinTech, RegTech, InsureTech, people will talk about Revolut or the Brazilian model. In no, US, so, I don't think there's any yeah. new any name. There yeah. were a lot of these new names. There's New Bank, in. which that's the Brazilian one. Right? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, or you can say zero the... Western world, let's see, you know, who have changed, who have gone to 30, 40, 50 billion. I mean, of course, Stripe is a great example. Yeah. And, and the jury is still out on European fintechs. Yeah. You know, nobody's really, they have one good year, one bad year. There's a bit of a, yeah. uh, you know, if you're average, if you churn, people stay in your organization for only one to two years. I mean, that's the other classic uh, uh, yeah, testament. Yeah. You know, Correct. That something is not right. Point I'm making is, this is not something you can disrupt overnight. You can go and get a Lithuania charter as a banking. Yeah. player, but you don't become a bank. You know, I was watching this uh, Jamie Dimon's interview. Somebody asked him, what do you do? And very interesting. He said, you know, I move $10 trillion every day. I do it for banks. I do it for UN. I do it for IMF. I do it for countries. I mean, that is, and, and without a glitch, because if a mistake happens, then countries yeah. come to a standstill. Absolutely. So how do you disrupt that? And, and, and lastly, the opportunity is not just in, see, India only has three cities. Because only three cities people go for, majority go for employment. Bangalore, Delhi, Mumbai, I mean, I, you can have a debate on this, but three cities. There is a massive India, you know, and the fin. How was Bandhan given banking license? Yeah. What was the whole or SAP you, model? Or, yeah. Exactly, right? So, Very Location specific. Exactly. There's there's this regional rural bank two step by step. What actually I, I am not personally seeing the fintechs focus on is look, I mean everybody wants to make money. Capitalism is no doubt there. But how do you really move beyond just an eight hundred million mobile phone users? Yeah. You know, today I can I mean I don't need to be in this country to be delivering my services to my clients. Forget my city or home or office. There is a massive opportunity in tier 2, 3, 4, 5, 10 cities. Uh, whoever can understand that will be the next bank. And then that's how you come to the cities. You don't, you cannot start with cities anymore because then it's a hobby. You know, you, you cannot play in, I feel you can't play in teenage or, or you know, homemakers. You go to play in the farthest corners and then it's like, you know, somebody is telling me, this pod podcast I saw, it's easier to make a dollar than to make an INR. So the yeah, best way is true. to launch outside and come to India. Uh, and then you'll be a success. Similarly, if you go to start from the, the tier 10, move up, automatically, you will win the cities and the banking license. Great observation. I want to ask you, Aparjeet, because you've obviously seen a gamut of companies, including ones that you also advise and invest in. Tell us some examples where you've seen this successfully play out and it could be in any segment. Uh, India has got a big problem both on the payment side as well as on the cyber security side with number of frauds. India has the uh, highest, uh, has got the highest incidence of fraud in most countries in the world. So there's a survey by I think ACI World which said that more Indians have experienced fraud than even Nigerians or uh, people in other countries. So this is something that we look at very closely and we invest in that and that's uh, that's there's a lot of money to be made in cyber I think because uh, organizations are increasingly finding that uh, cyber attack the cost of building cyber infra is far lower than uh, suffering a cyber attack so effectively uh, it's a very easy sell we, we looked at a startup the startup went and we asked them to meet uh, a bigger startup called Bank Open and within half an hour the founder walked out and said I've got a 
I've got a 8 lakh rupee revenue. I said, that's good enough, I'm investing. So uh, those are the type of businesses which we thought were successful. Uh, I think one or two, uh, go back to your previous question, you, uh, you did ask a question, what went wrong with startups? I think what went also wrong with VCs? Because uh, the startups will, startups are taking money from VCs. Whatever sells, they will prepare and sell. Uh, w what's important is that the people who are managing money have to have the maturity to sort of follow through with due diligence and with, uh, you know, maturity. And a lot of, a lot of these uh, ones where the, I would say that probably today in India with 100, uh, 100 plus unicorns, I would say 70 to 80 percent of them are not revenue unicorns, they're valuation unicorns. I, I mean, if you have to have a 8,000 crore of cap market cap or a billion dollars of market cap, I would think that you at least need to have 300 million dollars of revenue. If you take that number and you see how many companies are actually making 300 million dollars of revenue, that number, I would dare to say that there will be only 20 or 25 startups which are unicorns. So my view is that it's it's also an excess on the VC side which has resulted in a lot of these failures as compared to because this has come from the Bay Area culture where you know again uh, something like Uber which flag flagrantly violated laws and then got the benefits of building a big company. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, uh, you know, even Facebook had a logo that says move fast and break things. I mean, yeah. they sort of enshrined it in their uh, culture. Uh, this is this is something that the Western VCs came into. And I don't think it is necessarily wrong to have. But, you know, uh, in the financial services space, it is not because financial services is a highly regulated business. Uh, you're handling people's livelihoods, money. Uh, if things go wrong in financial services, millions of dollars of savings, someone can be rich or poor immediately. So uh, regulators are very, very firm with this. So you can't adopt that strategy. Yeah. And that's resulted in a lot of problems for them.